Um, well, we are going to keep the show moving forward here. <laughs> Another very important issue, and that is the Espionage Act in the United States, and especially how it has been wielded against the press and against political activists in the Venn diagram where those two things are at least accused of meeting. And we are mm -hmm. very, very happy to be joined by Carrie Shankman, who's an attorney, is a litigator. He specializes in human rights and constitutional law, but I have to say he's the co-author of A Century of Repression, The Espionage Act, and Freedom of the Press with Mr. Ralph Engelman. Carrie, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. No, of course. I think my hand was in the way. I'm going to hold that up one more time so people can see. There you go. <laughs> there it is for real. <laughs> you know, Carrie, I think in some ways people have probably heard snippets about the Espionage Act, especially, <clears throat> you know, those who are following the case of Julian Assange. But, you know, maybe just to give us some framing here as we get into it, you know, what is this Espionage Act and why was it originally passed? And I believe it was 1917. Yeah, so this law has been around for over 100 years, and actually the title of our book is A Century of Repression, because I think when we talk about the case of Julian Assange, when we talk about the modern whistleblower cases, I think there is an absence of context, and there is a 100-year political context when we go back to the passage of this law and the way that it's been used over the last 100 years, really against the left as a tool for information control. So... 1917, of course, was the year of U.S. entry into World War I, and that really frames the context of how this law was passed. Actually, Woodrow Wilson kicked off the suite of legislation, if you will, that was used to go after the Socialist Party, to go after the labor, labor movements at the time during his speech calling for U.S. entry into the, world, uh, into the war. And actually, the U.S. Ha had stayed out of what they considered this European issue, but then shifted course. And in doing so, Wilson said that he wanted to treat any disloyalty or dissent with, quote, a firm hand of stern repression. I'm not, I'm not making that up. That's not an exaggeration. That's the actual language that he used in his speech before Congress. And just within the next few months, the Espionage Act was passed as part of different legislation as well, including a Sedition Act, the first Sedition Act that the country had seen in, in over 200 years. So the repression of World War I, I think, really frames the, the period that followed. And as I mentioned, the World War I really was one of the most politically vibrant periods in, in the history of the U.S. with the Socialist Party and Eugene Debs uh, stronger than, than it had ever been the Wobblies, the industrial workers of the world ha had such, uh, such a strong presence in the country and they were targeted. The first 2000 plus prosecutions under the Espionage Act were of the Wobblies, were of the Socialist uh, Party. They didn't actually involve espionage. And that's, that's honestly one of the core misconceptions that we try to tackle in this book. And if, if you take nothing else from this segment, the most important thing to realize is that even though it's called an espionage act, it is not about espionage as you or I would casually understand that that term to mean. Yeah, I mean, it really is about chilling free speech at the end of the day. And it's really fantastic marketing if you think about it. I mean, to call it an espionage act, because um, that is what people think. It, it, they think it, it means, oh, these are spies, these are traitors. Um, Right. But le can you like, you know, bring us from then to now in terms of how is the Espionage Act being used today? Of course, we're seeing it be used against Julian Assange. The Espionage Act hasn't exactly been used many times since then. Are there other figures uh, that you can highlight uh, where this has been used to try to attack or suppress their work? And then in terms of Julian Assange, how is it being used? Absolutely. So during World War One, like I mentioned, it was used against dissidents and the anti-war movement. And the reason that was possible was because of broad language in the law that punished aspects like disloyalty, any opposition to the war effort. And the act had since been amended to turn into more of a tool of information control. And it was around the beginning of the Cold War that we saw this shift to prosecute government sources of what's called national defense information or, or folks that revealed information about US foreign policy or military efforts abroad. 
actually kind of a fascinating thread that that we uncovered were different uses of the act that aren't well known. So it was used during World War One and actually during World War II in the interwar period to go after the black press. For um, for example, publications like the Chicago Defender were some of the most prominent anti-war voices as well, because one of the questions was, well, why are uh, African-Americans being forced to fight wars abroad when we don't even have civil rights at home? In the rise of the career of J. Edgar Hoover, that was actually seen as seditious, and he was, uh, of course, deeply racist, and his philosophies were actually shaped by by the Espionage Act and this leg legislation in World War I. And so we saw actually those threads, we saw the Espionage Act be central to actually the case that literally sparked the McCarthyist uh, Red Scare, um, because in 1945 and onward, there was an investigation of several State Department employees that were leaking to the press about the situation in China. And, and several of those defendants in, at the time in Espionage Act case were named by McCarthy in his uh, famous Wheeling, Virginia speech that literally kicked off the Red Scare. So those politically, we see kind of the intersection of, as you pointed out, the branding of these cases as espionage when they really weren't espionage at all. There were folks that were, um, that were revealing information in, in the public interest. Zoom forward. So we're, we're talking about things like the Red Scare going after the black press. How does that take us to today with the case of Julian Assange with whistleblowers? What we've seen over the last hundred years is this gradual escalation of this law being used against the press. And there were moments when successive administrations got closer and closer to that line, but didn't cross it, either due to political pressures or legal issues. One of the most famous cases of that was the Pentagon Papers during the Vietnam War, when Daniel Ellsberg was prosecuted as a source for, um, for a historical study showing that the Johnson and Nixon administrations were lying to the public about the Vietnam War. Famously, Nixon tried to go after the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other papers who published the, paper, uh, the Pentagon Papers. But of course, those prosecutions and attempted prosecutions ultimately failed. During the Reagan administration and the rise of the nat modern national security uh, apparatus, publications and journalists that investigated and wrote books on the NSA and other agencies were actually investigated under the Espionage Act as well. But of course, these ended at threats until today, when we see prosecutions like that of Chelsea Manning, of Edward Snowden, and other government insiders, including Daniel Hale, who is uh, an alleged intercept source for the U.S. drone program. He's currently held in a communications management unit where he has difficulty even talking to his lawyers. And of course, as you pointed out, the case of Julian Assange. And the case against, uh, against Assange is absolutely unprecedented, both legally and politically, because it crosses a line that no administration has dared to cross in the past. Reagan didn't do it. Even Nixon didn't do it. And finally, the Trump administration decided to. And that line was to prosecute so, someone for the act of publication for, and if you read actually the, the criminal um, uh, complaint, the three indictments against Assange, there's a lot of talk that, oh, he's being prosecuted for hacking or a hacking conspiracy. Actually, for the dozens and dozens of paragraphs in that indictment, there's only three paragraphs that talk about any alleged uh, computer intrusion uh, offenses. And even then it's talking about uh, alleging an attempt at an attempt. The rest of it actually describes national security journalism. Literally, we're talking about use of anonymity tools. Uh, we're talking about uh, having a uh, alleged relationship with the source. And we're talking about literally publication, which is a line that's never been crossed in, in U.S. history. You know, I think that feels incredibly important, that last point there, Carrie, the implications if the line is crossed. I mean, we've seen the implications of even just the threat uh, of using it in the past and the way it's been wielded prior. I mean, talk about that, if you will, if the precedent is set for someone like Assange to be prosecuted in this way. What does it mean going forward to, well, what does it mean going forward, I guess, is the real question. Absolutely. So I, I think what's super important for folks to realize 
Julian Assange is not a U.S. government employee. He never signed any agreement with the U.S. government to adhere to classified information protocols, any of that. In addition, he is not even a U.S. citizen. So in terms of the precedent, this is really terrifying because it would assert that the Justice Department has jurisdiction over literally anyone on earth for publishing materials that the U.S. deems uh, would uh, expose information that it doesn't want to see exposed. And this, this prospect is literally terrifying because on the flip side, you have U.S. officials who are who are leaking information for personal gain on a daily basis. You open the New York Times, the Post, any of these mainstream papers any day, there's classified information everywhere, but it's self-serving. I mean, you go back uh, several years to, to General David Petraeus, who famously was providing a code word level information to his biographer and mistress, and he was given a slap on the wrist and is now making six figures on speaking tours. So what we're really seeing is the failure of due process, the failure of, of real justice, because it's up to political considerations at that point to consider who gets prosecuted. Um, in terms of the legal implications of the case, as I mentioned, the conduct that's described in the Assange indictment is a publication, is a journalist source relationships, is the use of anonymity tools. Uh, there are folks that that say things like, well, Assange is not a journalist. Um, that's, uh, I, I think, disingenuous given that most mainstream media outlets now are utilizing methods that WikiLeaks pioneered, such as publishing libraries of original documents, such as using source protection anonymity tools, like, for instance, SecureDrop, which was directly motivated and modeled uh, um, after after uh, WikiLeaks uh, methods, literally every mainstream, almost every mainstream organization uses those. So it's disingenuous, first of all, to say that well Assange isn't a, isn't a journalist. But on top of that, that's that view is legally irrelevant. It it claims that the First Amendment and human rights protections only apply to some special category of people called that meet the club of journalism, when in fact, by design, they're meant to protect everyone. So there's no legal distinction between Julian Assange and you and me. And that's really why the stakes of this case are, are, are so high. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Carrie, really appreciate you. And I'm, there are, of course, many superlatives, but I want to just say, most importantly, you are the author of A Century of Repression, The Espionage Act and Freedom of the Press, along with Ralph Engelman. Fantastic book. I really enjoyed it myself, and I can't recommend it any higher. And we really appreciate you coming on to help us sort through some of this.